everybody. I'm Alison Fenner working with IAB Europe and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Well, this wrote a programmatic webinar. It's the first series of webinars which aim to provide some key questions to stakeholders aiming to develop their programmatic strategy. So today we'll learn about how the traditional media buying model is changing, the instrument for a programmatic strategy and considerations for developing that strategy. We'll all hear first hand from a brand advertiser that start their road to programmatic. The webinar lasts about 50 minutes, four minutes for presentations and a 10 minute Q&A. Please note that the recording will be available to download and share after, uh, after the webinar. Uh, you'll find that on our website. So before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that uh, you know how to use the webinar controls. First of all, you should see a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You can minimize the panel by clicking the double arrow button in the upper left-hand corner and expand the panel by clicking the same button. So you can access that. You'll note that there is a chat panel and a Q&A panel. You can submit any technical queries through that panel and we'll respond to those. You can submit questions for the speakers using the Q&A panel located near the bottom of the control panel. Questions live during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If you need to help during the session, you can raise your hand by clicking the small hand just above the chat panel. I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters. We have presenting um, Gwen Wiley, who's Chairman of the IAB Europe Programmatic Trading Committee and also Senior Director at AppNexus. Joel Lucy, who's Director of Business Development and Privacy at Audience Science. Um, Anne Boussy Sokrat, Online Marketing Manager Evan Cycles and Helen Mile, Head of Marketing EMEA at TURN. Lastly, Rahman Mohammed, Head of Strategic Services at Yahoo. So to give you an introduction to the um, to the webinar and the white paper. Uh, I think we've seen during the first six months of 2015, advertising has been top of mind and at the center of everybody's discussions within the advertising industry. We've seen it as a top end of topic at um, conferences across Europe, for example, own Interact Conference, Ad Week in London, and the Festival of Creativity in Cannes. In IAB Europe, the topics assumed, assumed an ever-increasing importance. So you can see the small programmatic trading task force that we formed in 2014, now a fully-fledged IAB Europe committee with significant leadership across the uh, European market. While our first IAB Europe programmatic white paper, the focus was on defining programmatic and explaining why it was the subject of so much discussion, we've moved on this year to be able to analyze the decisions facing advertisers, agencies, and publishers, and to help people consider how to capitalize on the programmatic opportunity. We have our, our second uh, programmatic white paper, The Road Programmatic, intended to be a reference for stakeholders wanting to know more about strategy, on guidance from industry experts on the data technology operating models and related issues. You will use the white paper and that you will enjoy the content of today's webinar and our further surveys and reports on the programmatic topic to increase your own engagement and involvement in the subject. I'm going to hand over to Graham to introduce the topic of programmatic trading and its key benefits. Well, Graham. Thanks. Um, so, the move away from traditional media buying towards programmatic audience buying has been some time in development and I think it's safe to say that over the last couple of years it's been something that client side marketers could perhaps watch with interest but didn't necessarily need to understand in depth. And we came through 2013 and 2014 it was really a, a maturity point for the industry where it's on as Alison was touching on everybody's radar. Um, IB Europe's own research looked at uh, programmatic delivering 111% growth in 2013 in September of this year, IAB Europe will publish the 2014 programmatic market sizing numbers, and we expect to see that uh, adoption of programmatic accelerating. Really the migration away from uh, traditional media buying, uh, which is often based on relationships 
relationships and one-to-one -one conversations to dramatic audience buying is driven by the need for publishers and agencies and advertisers to operate on a very different scale and speed than what we've been used to traditionally. As the internet and digital advertising is pushed into every part of communications, uh, it is a challenge for marketers to respond to that in a way that positively engages audiences. But the data is a growing understanding and confidence around programmatic. In upcoming research to be released by IAB Europe later this month, uh, looked at attitudes to programmatic, half of advertisers uh, were doing some form of programmatic, but typically less than 20% of their spend. 50% of publishers were doing some form of programmatic, but it was typically less than 20%. And that's very much about being in an experimental phase, uh, trying and testing and seeing what working works. But across research, a third of all respondents were saying that in the next 12 months, they expect to see the use of programmatic grow by 11 to 30%. Um, and that move to buying audiences is surrounded by some complexity, some jargon, a lot of industry terminology, which is really the, the IAB Europe Programmatic Committee programmatic committees to unravel and explain. Um, and we saw a world where programmatic isn't just about experimentation, but it's about buying audience for brand and performance. Data and new capabilities to drive action. And that means that program audience buying drives new operating models inside publishers, agencies, and advertisers in order to capture the benefit promised. Have a look at what operational factors should be considered when thinking about that programmatic strategy, and I'm going to hand over to Joel for that. So the challenge in selecting an operational model that best suits an advertiser really comes from a complex and fast-evolving landscape. You don't want to make a decision that's outdated or won't stand the test of time, and that comes from two core questions. That are, who should be involved in delivering the programmatic solution? Should it be in-house teams? Should it be a managed service, either by an agency or by a tech provider? Should it be a pre-packaged solution? Or do you want to pick and choose a variety of solutions knowing they may or may not work well together? It's a bit like trying to get, uh, buy a car. Do you want to buy an engine and all the other parts separately and uh, put it together yourself? Do you want to buy a, a pre option? Do you want someone to recommend how you do it? And that begs a second question, which is, which business model is right fit? Do you, do you want complete transparency, web complexity and having to understand and know the details, or do you want it to be a risk-free product model so that may be less transparent? Um, and to answer those key questions, you can divide programmatic business models into two broad categories, that is programmatic products and programmatic services. So programmatic products, were the first to market. They combine the inventory, the tech, the data, and the expertise. There's like retargeting solutions, so companies like Critio, Struck, or MyThings, and a number of other companies offer that as part of their uh, their business. Or all these buying solutions, where um, they were all based on an insertion order and an agreed rate, either a CPM, a CPC, or a CPA, and really a defined outcome, whether that was bringing users back to your site, hitting a target demographic or delivering a number of leads or conversions of some kind. The benefit of that is the ease of buying and the ease of use and often very good results that are provided. There's no upfront cost, there's often no or a very low commitment and the advertiser can therefore shift budgets based on how the different products perform. The core advantage is that advertisers see a lack of control. The vendor doesn't always disclose which media they bought for which price, how they optimized, and, uh, and why those are the solutions they did. For us, uh, it was hanging over control is exactly what was required. So some advertisers will want more control than others. Some vendors will allow the advertiser to deploy things like ad verification tools in the buyer to control brand safety. But as with any product you buy, um, the buyer has limited control over how that is developed or the direction your programmatic partner will go in. And the second option a lot of people started to see more and more is the programmatic service model. So this is where the advertisers who want to take a great deal or even full control, and uh, the service model tends to be a better fit for that. Advertiser pays separately for the media for the technology, for the third-party data, and for the team of experts who bring it all together. 
the model is like a traditional agency model where the media cost and transparent pass through that can be audited and a fee is paid for the service. A true programmatic service model gives the market a control and accountability on the technology choice as well as access to all reporting and all performance data. The provider obviously delivers expertise to get the most from that technology. There's been a number of high profile examples of major consumer businesses adopting that model where the agency is providing the staffing and the services to support it. This is why the WFA has sometimes referred to this as the brand trading desk. It's a dedicated agency resource wrapped around the client's technolo chosen technology. Essentially, the agency and the client are working in unison to make sure that the selection is right for the client, but driven by expertise from the agency. The advantage of that model is obvious. The advertiser has complete transparency and control, but there are disadvantages. There is the, the accountability that falls on the advertiser for all of the fixed costs in that process. However, uh, sorry, in programmatic, there are also more levers to pull. And as search, it doesn't necessarily work for most tactics just to put a bid manager or the technology in pure control. It needs human intervention and human management to make sure that everything is working properly. Uh, the of taking control is that the advertiser will need to be involved or at least need to understand the different technologies that are used so there'll be things like a DSP, a DMP, verification tools, and different data sources. And they understand which media strategies are deployed, so whether it is an open exchange buy, where you're buying freely from across the, the gambit of all the publisher inventory available, or where private marketplace deals, so one-to-one -one relationships with individual publishers. And then finally, an advertiser needs to know how and why campaigns were executed. So down to who does the work. Five major operational models in the market. There is the agency having control, an independent uh, providing control, an independent agency rather having control, product services model, or the client taking it entirely in-house, and the fifth one really is, is a merger of all, any of those above. So Graham are now going to take us through some starting points for choosing the right solution for your company. So. Within the paper, um, we took a look at those different operating models and identified a, a series of decisions that organizations can take uh, that would take them through a particular uh, set of criteria to arrive at an operating model that's most likely for them. And that was something the committee spent a lot of time uh, discussing and developing, because that's actually quite difficult to do. There's a lot of ambiguity uh, in early stage market and as programmatic moves from being this early experimentation to being the mainstream way of doing business, um, the decisions will change. So I encourage everybody to look at the white paper and download a copy. Um, the decision tree is quite complex, so it didn't translate well to PowerPoint. Um, but download the white paper uh, and take a look. What I'm really trying to do here is bring the decisions that organizations make. Um, and as Joel mentioned, no one likes making a decision with a, a lack of information. And yet, if you've been to any of those conferences that Alison referred to at the beginning, um, there are a lot of single solutions being proposed or examples of what worked for me. Very little to frame the conversation about how each business should pursue it differently. And this white paper has really been designed to fill that part of the market information, to frame a process that allows you to uh, go through a decision tree, tell you about where you're business is and reach some conclusions about what the right strategic operating model should be for your business. A dramatic moves from being an isolated experiment, less than 20% of your inventory or what you're spending, to the mainstream part of your business. And the committee actually was able to frame that around uh, the beginning of that decision-making process starts with really understanding the answer to uh, five questions. And, and Joel's just going to run through those five questions now. The best of defining that operational model is to have five key smart questions that really get to the root of what you're looking to do and how you're looking to achieve it. First is, do I understand where business is starting its programmatic journey? Have, or how much data do we have on our users? Or how much data do we have access to as well through external partnerships? What are our technical capabilities? Why are we changing to a programmatic model? And what are we actually looking to get out of it? That, that really is absolutely key in the technologies you choose. Then when you're looking at the partners who you want to work with, it's worth finding out how they make 
their money. They are businesses. They are obviously there to make money. But are they a technology company? Are they a media company? Are they a mix of the two? Who do they partner with themselves and why do they choose the partners they choose? Um, then the third one is, is my organization happy to pay by results? Or do we need a more granular understanding of where our money is being spent? Do results uh, link to how much money is being spent? Or are you just after results for their own benefit? Uh, one is obviously related, which is, do I have the budget, do I have the people, and do I have the resources to the change I think is ideal? Or will I get it if my business case is strong enough from internal resource? And then how do I measure progress? How do I know when I've arrived? I would argue you've probably never arrived in the world of programmatic. You'll always be seeking to improve and do better. But how do I know when I'm at the, uh, the kind of point I need to? What does success look like? So the your programmatic committee is representative of uh, publishers, agencies, technology providers, and the consensus was that in answering those five questions, any organization is a very good starting point for determining a strategic offering model for their business. Um, at the point you've got a hypothesis about what the operating model might be, it's then necessary to think about the tools and technologies that you might need to deliver that, the toolkit, if you like, from a buyer's point of view or from a seller's point of view. The downside of, of an early stage market is there's lots of different claims from vendors and lots of different conversations and lots of different terminology. And, and in the conversations, a lot, of the, a lot of the conversations focused around the fact that the techies all end up sounding the same. Um, and so what we tried to do within the white paper was to look objectively at actually the role that these technologies fulfill. What is it you need a DSP to do, for example? And then the paper drills down into more depth about specific questions to ask around a DSP. But before we before we get to that part of the white paper, it's probably worth actually, Joel, just, just defining what a DSP is for those who didn't get the chance to read the first white paper. Absolutely. The, the online ad industry is built on nothing if not three-letter acronyms. A DSP is a demand-side platform. It's a to use to purchase advertising in an automated fashion. It's it advertisers and agencies to manage online media campaigns by facilitating the buying of auction-based media. That is, you can buy your ad space in an auction. Uh, whether it's split, mobile, video, social, native, or anything else, or any mix of those. And you can add audience data into that across all those different inventory and data suppliers. And it's a one, sort of one stop for doing so. It's a centralized management platform. Uh, the, second point, uh, the second acronym we have is the Data Management Platform, or DMP. That combines online behavioral data, so demographic data with offline data, and all any essentially any data you can get your hands on. If it's brought online, it can be run through a DMP, and it can all be merged, centralized into one hub of customer intelligence. Um, it's all run from one place. And they can start asking who are the company's best customers, how do they behave in the digital and physical worlds, and data for as much insight as you can to help target your campaigns using a DSP. Uh, DMP, there's a promise of an easy instant access to actionable feedback. Uh, data can paint a picture that confirms intuition. It could even disprove your intuition. It can empower marketers to make further refinement. And that can be surprising, leading you to take a different course of action altogether. And either way, building your programmatic activity on the foundation of the data gives you insights that are based on facts that can result in new confidence and much more decisive action, and it allows you to do so in near to real time. The DSP informs the decisions that are implemented through the DSP and uh, should feed into and from your full strategy. That's what's happening from a buyer's point of view about programmatic. Um, from a seller's point of view, in a, an, an SSP. So an SSP sits almost as the opposite of a DSP. It's the supply side platform. It's a pragmatic technology platform for publishers. It's where they're able to put the ad space into. And again, it's an auction which enables them to monetize their inventory and, when managed, will help them to maximize their yield and protect their assets. In all their ad space programmatically, publishers need a technological inface, interface rather, to establish the connection to the auction. In the same way, stock exchanges in various countries are powered by tech platforms such as OMX, 
uh, in the mine ad industry. They're powered by a variety of different SSPs and exchanges. Okay, thank you. Useful overview for, for what was next. I think going back to the white paper and just to summarize where we've got to, uh, so the, the white paper includes this decision tree and the choice around operating model. Um, it then is an overview of the toolkit available, and all of that is designed to allow readers to think about their programmatic strategy. What's the right balance of technology and services? What's the right balance between paying for technology and uh, wrapping it all into a media spend? What's the right solution in terms of taking a full view of the market versus pursuing specialist answers or maybe mobile or video development? So one again, a plug the white paper, do download it and, and, and read in depth, and then back to Alison. Thanks, Raymond Joel. Some really useful points there for the start on the road to programmatic, and lots of questions, which is, I think, one of the most important things that people remember to ask the right people the right questions. So, to hear from a brand and cycles that started that uh, road to programmatic journey in collaboration with Turn. So, I'm going to hand over to Ange and Helen. Well, guys. Um, so, just Taking a step back, um, you know, in terms of looking at the opportunity um, at a generic level, obviously, Ash can talk specifically about why Evans wanted to get into programmatic. Um, but at a general level, there is some massive opportunity for brands to take advantage of uh, these tidbits of information that are um, around us. So it's all of the data that every single one of us is creating every day, and not just taking advantage of it um, every day, but actually, you know, almost to the second and in real time. Uh, we're receiving five times the amount of information per day than we did in 1986. Every minute, 160 million emails are sent, 1,500 blog entries are created, 6,000 tweets are written, um, and almost 695,000 Google searches are undertaken. So there's this massive, massive amount of data, and that's coming from our smartphones, from our television, from our um, email, from our social news feeds every single second. And so there's a real battle to get the consumer's attention. So as a brand, you need to, to be smarter, um, more relevant, and more timely in the advertising that you're doing. Um, so this, this, uh, this data that is being generated really does provide a golden opportunity for advertisers. If you can just harness the right pieces of information, there is a lot of data out there. You don't need all of it, but how do you work out what is the right um, data that is relevant to you and to your brand and your brand objectives? And doing that in real time, because of course, it's ever-changing landscape. This data is changing with each event and each consumer touch point. So how do you make your advertising be the most relevant, the most timely, and the most effective that it can be? I'm going to introduce Arne now. He's going to talk a bit more about um, end cycles, um, why they wanted to get into programmatic, um, and some of the, uh, the results that they've seen. Um, to start, I have a lot of thoughts on why you choose to take this um, amazing programmatic role. On one hand, we had this fragmented digital media landscape Helen was speaking about. On the other hand, we are competing strongly to get our consumer attention. Cycling enthusiasts are the seasonal cyclists. Our initial aim was to develop an agile process to reach our audiences. We would keep flexibility in our communication at different times of the year. Well, we realized that the interest of seasonal cyclists was fluctuating with external factors such as the weather or the build access in cycling events. That is why we have built a programmatic approach to refocus the communication on our consumer and prospect. This enables us two objectives. Uh, firstly, to build a single view of the banner performance Access our um, online advertising activity. We created the digital bond campaign into one place, one technology. And secondly, to better use the data insights 
from the campaign to support the creative decision. For example, we can run different set of banners at the start of the campaign and then increase delivery of the best performing message. Um, so now, um, if we see a bit more um, how we have implemented this programmatic advertising, basically we are following uh, a fourth step process. First, we define the objective, then we collect the data uh, to create and build the, the audience, the campaign, and finally optimize uh, based on the insight the campaign is going to generate. And need to add the objective if uh, we need uh, we need to base on the real data we are seeing from the campaign. Over the last 18 months of programmatic activity, we have been gathering data from various sources, such as on-site behavioral navigation, sorted partners, external data vendors, or private marketplace with key publishers. This resulted of creating more than 100 different grand audiences demographic and geolocalization targets. Then to improve the performance, we are following this iterative process. We one of the effective programmatic benefits to apply reactive adjustment in real time before the campaign. And particularly useful for, uh, for example, the volume of banner impression in a specific package campaign is too low or uh, at the level of, of CPM rather than the one we, we want to. This is a, a framework a process. It's not quite perfect yet, but we are working to make it more consistent and to speed this cycle. Our pain management process has also evolved, starting agency head, talking uh, directly with DP and eventually being managed in-house with available media specialists. To learn a few takeaways after these 18 months of programmatic experience, I recommend to define first your objective, understand what success is going to look like, increase the online sales to generate traffic, to reach a specific targeted audience, to understand uh, better what is going to work for your brand. So, as we well, know, a Bayon doesn't make a cyclic champion. It's worth that is going to do it. So, people and the specialists who are going to run the campaign and make it work for you. For example, will be, will be to find a trading plan in advance, make of semi attendance, uh, online marketing certification internal knowledge sharing. With this programmatic complexity, a step-by-step -step approach could be quite useful. We also have many people in this space passionate about programmatic things and willing to help to go extra mile. Finally, uh, sometimes we learn more from our mistakes, so don't, be afraid to, don't try to change from the new direction if needed. Helen. It's great to get a first hand idea of how brands are embracing programmatic um, and to learn about your ideas on um, your mistakes, Ange, and asking the experts. And indeed, that's kind of the approach that we're trying to um, implement here at IAB Europe uh, by bringing people together, um, bringing those who've tried and tested to um, help others along their way. So now I'm going to introduce from an who's going to give an overview of the value chain involved in a programmatic strategy. Welcome, Rahman. Thanks, Alison. Okay, so the diagram in front of you was a uh, part of a report produced at the end of 2014 by the World Federation of Advertisers um, and sparked industry-wide debate. For this issue, we would expect to see between 80 and 90 percent of revenue on any given campaign. But with product technology coming into play, um, with the, along with the more obvious targeting efficiencies it bought, there also came a definite shift in the value chain that many marketers were unaware of. Specifically, the technologies and services that enable programmatic trading do not come without cost. With both sellers investing in these areas and these technologies, 
um, those costs then disrupted the traditional model. Stakeholders in the diagram, it's worth noting immediately that some, some are actually intrinsic to programmatic trading and it can't take place without them. This doesn't mean that there are not methods of reducing costs across them, but for example, a demand side platform um, or an exchange or an SSP are typically going to be needed if trading is going to take place. And there's also some compelling evidence that su suggests that a build-your-own strategy for key transactional technologies such as this within the programmatic area will more likely increase costs and reduce flexibility. So generally, it's advisable to avoid this. Though where there is immediately identifiable room to improve clarity, understanding um, in traditional relations, so in trading relationships, is actually net, it's across the value adds um, area, um, which represents around 25% on, on this diagram. Partners generally provide verification, measurement, analytics, data, viewability, media playing attribution, and so on. It's not to say that these innovations are unnecessary or do not add value. Um, they absolutely do. Um, but there is a relevant to particular trading conditions that needs to be considered and can provide a cost efficiency um, if addressed correctly. What are the key points to consider when thinking about your programmatic strategy? First, is the service actually required? Um, taking a very basic example, um, uh, you know, if you're a, tree, um, a trusted premium publisher with a single unit above the fold offering only owned and operated um, supply, and you have a long-standing um, trusted trading relationship with the buyer, um, you know, it's questionable. Is there really a requirement for things like viewability or, in fact, many of the brand safety features that a buyer may be applying to all of their programmatic partners, regardless of their individual trading situations? It's one of the kind of things you need to start thinking about. This further extends itself to services which require but could potentially be paid for by both sides, or double dipping as it's called up here. Unheard of for the same service to be paid for twice at different points in the sales or tech chain. For example, brand safety is something that's taken seriously by all stakeholders and benefits to all for using it. The buy side use it to buy with confidence, protecting brand image um, and ensuring high quality content. Meanwhile, the side might be using it to identify and prove to the buyers its most premium opportunities or in taking steps to greater transparency. However, if both are uh, using independently and both are incurring a cost, um, there's a double payment there which isn't necessarily required. Consultant services is also an option that should be considered. Have identified which solutions do add value and where they need to be applied, the next step should be to consolidate services um, if that's a possibility. There are a lot of advanced services in the market that will be their relevance and even necessity in the ecosystem. Actually, they may well provide a service to a higher level than others who may provide it as an add-on to their existing broader technology. But a broader system or service could a financial economy of scale that could outstrip the value that you get from multiple specialists. Choosing a vendor that offers brand safety, viewability, attribution, and audience verification altogether would likely be cheaper than using multiple vendors with individual specialisms. It's just something you need to try and weigh up. The payment is also something that should be looked at. More attention to what fees are calculated against could also go some way into alleviating what some people have dubbed the technology tax. Fees will be calculated as a percentage fee based on revenue, but it's good practice to question if this is the most prudent way of doing things. On the surface, this might seem fine. They may make, um, the, sorry, they, may make, they may make more money as the brand makes more money, but the investment to this isn't always, um, isn't always a bad situation. Let's take a 468 by 60 ad unit versus a billboard unit. A publisher may want to charge more for the billboard um, because it takes up more of the web page's real estate, and likewise, an advertiser may agree to pay more because they feel it's a better branding opportunity. But is this really fair at the point where a tech or service provider charges more just based on the increase in the ad's value rather than a change in the service they provide um, or the kind of cost that they incur? Do you think it's fair to say that through better understanding and analysis of buying behaviors and more tailored offerings, um, there's still a lot of value to be added? Um, the challenge is managing this at scale. We're now going to move on to our Q&A. I've got a couple of questions to kick off for Graham. So I think um, following on from Raman's point about Raman's key consideration, it would be interesting just to address that, that uh, segment that we've identified in terms of the, um, the, the return. How are we seeing a better performance uh, within programmatic? So one of the things that the debate that was prompted by the WA uh, view of the supply chain. And Mary Claire, if we can just pop that slide back up uh, two slides ago. One is that is missing from this chart is the actual outcome for the marketer, the performance. So historically, a client would put 100% of their funding in and they buy a 100% outcome. 
uh, of normal levels of performance, and performance would be defined in terms of traditional performance market marketing metrics of, of conversions or behaviors that you're trying to, to drive, or it might be about brand uplift um, and brand measurement. So talking about performance in its broadest sense, the objective that the marketer is tasked with fulfilling. And when you add that consideration to this chart and, and consider what happens to performance, it's entirely possible that a client who's investing wisely is putting 100% of their funding in as that money is reaching the publisher in effective or working media, but keeping performance because that money is being invested in a more targeted fashion using programmatic, maybe 110, 150, 200% of what it was previously. So the notion of understanding the supply chain and the very comprehensive view that Raman gave in terms of those different elements, it's important certainly the marketer and the buy side to think about that in terms of what is objective outcome and what performance am I driving? And looking at the best technology investments yield a return on that. If you're putting 100% of your funding in and you're driving a better performance with a low working media, then marketers are doing a great job. They're driving performance outcomes. 100% of the money in and less of it's going to working media and your campaign performance dips, there's some areas of that uh, supply or value chain which are not performing way. And then you can look at optimization of that whole, whole yeah. scope. And I think for publishers, uh, that's, a, that's a very worrying statistic. If you have a publisher business and you're now receiving maybe half the revenue that you used to see, what role does programmatic play in your business? And the opportunity there is for publishers to think about how do they really value, perhaps in that value add section, how do they use their audience data and insight to help the market to be more effective, to the agency better to target spend. And so the whole shift to programmatic create new dialogue between buyers and sellers driven around, uh, as Joe was talking about, the five questions, what are we trying to achieve with programmatic yeah. at the beginning? So there's a terrific opportunity to, uh, to understand the operating model and the technology uh, and, and, and evaluate it based on the performance of the campaign, whether that's brand or, or direct metrics of response. I think that, that comment on performance overall and thinking about programmatic's focus on audience buying are you seeing those two factors leading to an increase in advertising investment in display? Um, it's a difficult there's, question to answer, Graham. Uh, there is a, a you know, in, in IAB UK, for example, has just published their media owner sales techniques results, and 45% of media uh, in the UK, digital display media, is now being sold programmatically. Um, and it's a very performance driven uh, market, but increasingly we're seeing brand spend come into programmatic because it is a much more efficient way of managing campaigns and delivering results. Uh, the challenge is for the industry to move beyond uh, last-click attribution and some of the flawed uh, evaluation models. Again, referring to the white paper, um, we have over 20 contributing authors to this white paper, um, and three or four of those contributed a body of knowledge around how attribution models will change as programmatic develops. I think will make it more effective and more open to brand spend. So those brand advertisers who are looking at programmatic, the model might be slightly different because clearly if you're advertising your brand, you're not uh, looking for an immediate result or a digital click through to sale, which is where a lot of the early innovation in programmatic has happened. You're looking at a multi-channel model. Um, but I think as the understanding of the operating models develop, then we'll see brand advertisers and brand spend coming to, uh, to the programmatic world. I think we are already seeing that in different markets. Yeah. So you talked a lot about the operational model, and indeed that's evolved a lot over the last couple of years. Do you, do you want to share some sort of thoughts on how you see that evolving over the next couple of years? Essentially, it is a spectacularly fragmented um, industry. There are so many different options out there, and I think the main kind of problem that we'll see over the next couple of years is more consolidation and more understanding uh, from advertisers, from agencies, from different technology providers of which companies offer best services. And as always in the ad tech industry, we'll see a huge number of uh, companies being bought up. And uh, that will probably mean that you start seeing um, kind of different sections of the industry offer offering their entire kind of stack, as it's known, where you may, um, through one company, you're able to buy all the different solutions you want. But there will still be that freedom to pick and choose and to uh, to build the car yourself if you want to. Yeah, okay, thanks. Talking about 
One of the bigger challenges, and again, it's something that's addressed in the white paper, it's um, cross-channel. So I just wanted to go back to Helen and Ange uh, and ask you a question about um, cross-channel advertising and whether Promatic has helped you in that respect and how you've approached it. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, we are actually using programmatic to connect the, the dots across different devices, for example. Um, so we understand better the, the performance coming from uh, the mobile campaign, um, especially with product retargeting. When we communicate um, at, to the user on a desktop device and then on a mobile campaign, and then we can uh, build emails, uh, the second one, the mobile campaign. So, for example, we can start a deliver campaign when somebody on the on the mobile when somebody has bought on, on the on the desktop. Working on to integrate further the, the channel to set up a data management uh, platform, uh, for example, in the future. As you uh, get more involved in doing multiple channel um, campaigns programmatically, obviously you get to learn more. So we've seen that, um, you know, probably what people know intuitively, but we have the, the, the data and, and the results behind it, that as you look at different devices, actually potentially there are different messages that, that suit the different devices. So you may, and, and mixing in sort of other elements as well, like time of day, um, day parting can actually have a real big influence. Um, and this does vary a little bit by sector, um, but we have seen um, different results where, you know, for instance, in the morning you may be pu pushing a brand, more branding message, and then the afternoon or evening as people are starting to change um, their receptivity and think about different things, you can put more of a, a sales-driven message um, on a different device. Um, so we've seen that work quite well um, with a with number of uh, customers, actually. About sales and ROI, Helen and Arne, have you got any further thoughts you want to share on how um, on it's evolved over the last 18 months? Um, yeah, it's a good question because we uh, we are looking to to have an impact on the global ROI and to increase uh, the sales. Um, and we have seen some results, but we're not from one day to another. It's an increasing process uh, where we have um, kind of set up the, the technology and understand what was working well and test different campaigns. So. With a more commercial focused campaign, such as a product retargeting, I think some, some good ROI and an increase on, on that. With the campaign, it's probably more focusing on the, the start of the buying decision, just the start of the sales funnel process. Influence the, the sales, but be later on. We have implemented this kind of two different uh, campaign to to see an overall uh, uplift on the set. Very much, Raman. Do you have any final thoughts on how um, the value chain may evolve? Uh, I mean, I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit tough one. I think um, look, inevitably there's going to be new tech products services um, entering the market. Um, but there'll also be um, a fair amount of consolidation. Um, unless there's greater control on where the services, services can be applied, for example, across one piece, um, one pocket of supply versus another, then it's still going to be down to the buyers and sellers to determine what's right for them. Um, so how the value chain appears for each partner is going to depend on, you know, on which services and products they use. Um, I think at the heart of that, the guiding principles are still going to have to be the same, focusing on the value it delivers versus the cost um, you know, of that service. Um, so, I mean, all I think our chain will continue to look similar, um, but with the view ads piece missing, um, not because it's not important, um, but because there'll be better ways to apply it, um, and, I, and I think that's where we're going to start seeing changes. Okay, very much. So, I'd like to finish off by uh, thanking all of today's presenters and participants. It's really great that the uh, the panelists have been able to share experience and also that we've been able to talk about the white paper where as Graham mentioned um, nearly 25 people I think contributed to the white paper in the end.
So if some things that you'd be interested in doing, please in contact with us at IAB Europe. Uh, please look out for the um, link to the webinar recording and also download the white paper, have a good read through and complete survey at the end of the webinar. Um, we've got further webinars coming up in September, October, specific on the buy side and the sell side. We'll also have our programmatic market sizing figures in September. So please do look out for further relevant projects from IAB Europe and stay in touch. Thank you very much.